So, welcome to R. That's it, guys. This is it. This is the... Let's uh, move everything here so everything is ready. This is how it would look like, at least for me, when I'm going to show you here how R works. This is with R Studio on top. So you have a few more things to look at and get an overall better feel. Now, first, I'm just going to take it very simple. You can, of course, read along, try along the code with me on your own computer at your own pace, or you can watch this lecture back later. No problem. Take your time on it. But first, I'm going to just explain a few things so you know what you're looking at, because that will help a lot, I think. So um, let me start. First, the big window here, or at least that's the one I set to, because I think it's very important to show you what's going on. This big window here is the script. You can see it as a recipe. It is basically all the code that you and I would write down. And this code is what you can execute, which would then be executed over in the console here on the right. This is where all the output will come of your code. So these two windows are extremely important, of course. We're going to be working through the script here, as you can see I'm scrolling up and down here. This is where we're going to be simply be taking a look at all the code. I am not sure if you guys can see it. Is this large enough? Please let me know right now if this is not large enough and I will go ahead and zoom a bit more if you guys cannot see. So this is the chance you guys have to influence how am I going to showcase this here today. So let me know if this is not large enough or if it's actually okay. Because I want you to be able to read what's going on. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was at least uh, one respondent. That's pretty good. Now, we got two more windows in here we need to take a look at. First, we have the environment down here in the bottom. I kept it rather small, not because it's not important, but um, it's simply something we are going to be using maybe a little less. However, what's going to happen in your global environment? This is basically where all your variables are being stored or data sets that you have currently in memory. So every time we load in some data or we create variables, you will see them displayed down there. I'll call out later as we go along. Today, we're not going to load in data that's coming up for future weeks. Today, we're only going to work with what is already in R and simply generate our own variables and give it a quick look at what R can do for you. Now, finally, we got this very multifunctional box down in the lower right corner. I currently have it on help because that's what we're going to be using it a lot because help, the help function R is pretty damn good. Otherwise, go on GitHub, go on wherever you want to go, uh, beware. Now I'm actually forgetting what all the names of these places are, but there's so many. Stack Overflow it was. So many places we can go and get help. It's a good place to start, good place to check, but our internal help system is also very, very good. And I'll be using it quite a bit, at least to uh, look at what is the syntax of different things. You can also display all the plots you may have made, because of course we're going to be plotting a lot. We're going to be making graphs, simply going to be making uh, yeah, different tables, and you can all display it here. We can also look at different packages and so forth there, and we can even look at our own directory here. So there's many, many things you can do here. So let's dive into R, shall we? And uh, let me first make one difference between what is a comment and what is regular code. So because I could, of course, just press this run button that I'm hovering over here. That will execute the entire code. I'm not interested in that because I want to show it piece by piece, of course. So often you're going to see me simply mark a piece of code like this and simply just run that chunk of code. This chunk of code I ran here set my directory, set my working directory. I'll get back to in a moment what I mean by a working directory. But to disentangle what is meant by a comment or not, Simply anything that has a hashtag in front is now read as a comment in R. That is, even if I would run this code, it wouldn't really execute. It would just read it as a comment and it wouldn't make an error. But if I, for instance, just would type help without anything, help is not a known function, help is not anything you're actually doing in this case here, then it will give an error. Let me just try out here. So if I just would write help here, you see it already comes up with something here like something's up. It will simply just come with a lot of different things here. That is not what we're interested in. So putting a hashtag in front also turns the text green and therefore will not be executed. It's a very good idea to comment on your code so we can read and understand what you've been doing. And also because you, will not, you don't want to be in the case that when you initially write the code, 
only you and God knows what went on. You don't want to come back to it two months later and only God knows what happens here. You want to be able to backtrack yourself and figure out what happened. Now, this is a... So I find that to be very, very important. Now, what am I hovering over here on line 17? That is a neat little code I found to make sure that you clean everything that is up in your console. So basically your output screen, right? Now, let's first start with what does the set directory do? It simply tells you from which place in R am I currently saving things to if I would save something or loading things from if I want to load with you know, a shortcut, say. So I set this as my working directory. As you can see, you can simply just read out and you know, know oh, Stefan uses Dropbox. Oh, fantastic. Stefan's assistant professor. Oh, fantastic. And Stefan's teaching. Well, I hope so. That's what I'm doing here. And you can see it. I put it in my programming for UR folder. So here I set my directory. Suppose this doesn't work because right now you see, yeah, but I just type some code. How am I supposed to know this? Well, there's different ways you can actually do this. You can simply just also sometimes go and use this help screen here to set your working directory. So here you can browse around your computer actually and set as working directory. That's one way of doing it. You can also simply use the drop down menu here. And let me see if I can actually find it. Now, I never remember where everything is because that's the wonder when you do, when you're simply gonna, yeah, hover around a bit, but see your session here, set work directory. And then you can actually go and choose your directory from where you wanna work from. So there's different ways of doing this. And when you know the code, you can also just copy the address like I did here, put in some quotation marks and you are good to go. I would highly recommend you guys to simply just go and check out and get a feel for what is in here. What do we have up here? And especially when you're gonna get around to tools and install packages, that's a very good place to be. I don't think you can actually see it here because uh, I'm not sure if it actually displays everything, but you should just go and take out all these drop down menus and simply get a good look and good feel for what is happening. This is the best recommendation I can give you. Now, let's uh, carry on for now. So I put an overview up here what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna of course look at the help function here in just a second. We're gonna look at some basic data structures, operations, and one of my favorite things to do, random number generation. Because random number and probability is something I really like to do. So that's why I put that up almost in front because that's one of the things we're gonna be doing first. Well, first in terms of the course, but last in terms of today's lecture. So I hope uh, everybody's with me so far and everybody's still awake. We are only 20 minutes in, so um, I can already say, we're already starting on the R file. This is going relatively fast for my pace. So I'll see where it goes and see if we are gonna be done earlier today. Can't guarantee that for the coming weeks, but today was just an introduction day, right? So it'll also leave some time for questioning. Let's uh, scroll down a bit and start with a help function. There are of course different ways that you can actually use the help function. So I listed up four different ways of actually doing exactly the same thing. Now let's just try to help and then use brackets and LM. Why am I using LM? Because, well, I know that it's the linear models, something you're gonna come back to a lot in this program. Why? Because regression analysis is kind of an important tool when you study econometrics. You won't be able to do without. So linear models is something you're definitely gonna be working with in R. You're also gonna be doing a lot of simulations, but that's what's gonna come later. Here, when you put the help function, you see that the lower right corner now changed a lot. We can, of course, put this up a little bit move it around so you can see it a little better perhaps. But here you get all the code, you get all the help, you get the help file explaining what you're gonna do. Most importantly, it actually tells you the syntax. It tells you exactly how you're supposed to set it up, how you're supposed to use this formula. We're, gonna, we're not gonna be using this before lecture four or five, I believe is regression week. Don't hang up on it because my memory has been pretty damn bad after I had a kid, I can tell you that. Having a kid is one thing that destroys your memory, but um, it's still here. I still remember to have a lecture today, so I guess that's something, right? And it also explains all these different things that you have here, which is really, really great. And more importantly, and this is the best part, you scroll down and well, if I'm not mistaken, it gives you examples, which is well, what we live for. 
I cannot tell you how I've learned most of the things simply just by scrolling straight down to the examples and get to understand what's going on here. So you can simply go down here and try out some of these things. And otherwise, if this doesn't work for you, Google is your friend despite them stealing our data. Still our friend. They still help us a lot. Now, my coffee cup is empty, so that means I need a little more. Do I drink too much coffee? I don't know. I only drink a can a day. Is that a lot? I don't know. Um, but um, gotta love it. So let's. Uh, if one help function doesn't work, as you can see over here, there's different options. Then try another one. For some of the things, it wouldn't re respond to the first one. For instance, when we're gonna do the some of the mathematical operations here later, it wouldn't respond to the first help version. But if I would do, for instance, the fourth one here, it would. So just try them out a little bit and get a feel for what works and what doesn't. It's all going to be a lot of trial and error. And I swear, you're going to see a lot of red code and be a, see a lot of frustration here. So let me already warn you up front, you're going to spend a lot of time on these assignments. And it's a lot of trial and error. So start early. It's a very good idea. The exam is easy. Oh, did a teacher just call this exam easy? Yeah, I did. And that's on purpose because... If you actually did the assignment and get to the exam, the exam is relatively easy. I swear, you can ask any previous student here that the exam is not that bad. However, the exam has been different the last couple of years because the course has been online and so has the exam. However, this time we're going back on campus. So, meaning that we're going to go back to our pen and paper exam. And I swear that is not that bad. Now, let's go in. Oh, oh so, so redeeming coffee. There we go. That's a, that's a good choice. Thanks, guys. Mm-mm. Let's try and check this one out. Okay, let's scroll down and start with some simple objects in R. Like the first thing we want to do here is actually create an object named X. But wait a minute. This is not actually what we're doing. What did I write here as a comment? Creating an object and binding it to a name? So no, guys, X is not the object. Let me first run this code. Yeah, it would say here that X is now at a value 5, and you see it appears down in our global environment. But actually what you're doing in R and the way you should understand this is that you are creating the object five and tying it to a name X. Okay. So that means I can of course just run X and print out X as you see up here in the console, simply just by running the next line. So what I'm doing here, I'm again creating an object five and tying it to a name X. I'm not creating an object X. I'm actually naming my object five X may take a little time to get around, but it's very important you understand it this way. Because when you're going to work with pointers and where are you pointing things and where everything is going, it's a very good idea to know. So that's why you can actually assign it in two ways. You see x equal 9 or 9 is equal x. I will just for the sake of simplicity just call x equal 9 because that's how we would read it. But you have to know it's an object 9 named x. This would give exactly the same value here. And of course now I overwrite the previous pointer, right? So you see down in my environment now, x is 9. And this seems pretty simple. And I can also go back and run this code again, and now x will be 5, right? Indeed, it will. I would strongly suggest you use the arrow here instead, because that also shows more where things are pointing, where it's going to. It gives you a better sense of, well, direction. Yeah, I see what I said there, I know. Use arrows. It's a very good idea. Although most of the time, it will give exactly the same outcome. For instance, if I go to line 10, and I point the arrow the other way, so 10 now points the other way, so I put the code reversely, it will get the same result. Now x is 10, as you can see down in my global environment. So that's uh, not too bad, I hope. Because um, now comes something, the first, yeah, I would say the first time you'd be puzzled, but you should already have been puzzled by now, I guess. If I run line 54, I'm actually not creating a copy. No, we're just tying the object 10 again to Y now. So that means the object now pointing at two places. It's not a copy, it just has two pointers. That's the way it is. It also saves a lot of space doing it this way, but that's a different discussion. We're not gonna go into here today. But what you can see here, I'm simply not copying. You could read it as a copy and it's fine by me you do that, but I just want you to understand what you're actually doing is not creating a copy. You're actually just creating a, a second pointer. 
for their original, well, point. I know. Fun times. I get it. So, that's that's the first thing we should start with. And we're not going to dwell with it because I swear to you it's going to get a lot more interesting as we go. We have the rm function here. And you may think about, what the hell is rm? So you can always go here, question mark rm, and it tells you down here, it's a function to remove objects. Nice. You can, of course, also just go down here and press this little brush here and it'll remove all objects. But you can, of course, also code it, which is a lot better, and simply just remove the objects. You see, I ran code 58. You see down my environment, it's gone. And just to double check, you can just call X afterwards and it says, error, object X not found. So RM, very nice way of removing objects inside your code. So don't get fooled by this seems very easy so far. The learning curve is very steep in this course. So we take it very simple, take it step by step, but it's gonna go up fast. Like next week, you're gonna discuss functions already. And that may seem like, oh, I just learned the basics. I can, learn, I can create an object, which is great, but we're gonna take steps up rather fast. And hopefully you should be able to use this throughout your entire education, at least here on a programming for UR course. And I also know for a fact you're gonna be using this as it comes later on. Hmm. So the thing is here, you have now removed the pointers, right? That's what we did with this remove function. Then R has something called a garbage collector. You can read more about it in the advanced R book online, which I highly recommend you always read for every week, but at least go and just use it as like a, like a little referral book. But here it just comes around and cleans up. You can of course call it GC. You can use that command to call it, but it simply just cleans up in your memory in the back. Not something you're gonna worry a lot about, but it's good to know. And what I'm gonna do next here, I'm gonna generate three objects, X, Y, Z, boom. Now I have X10, or 10 is X, mm -hmm. Y3 and C5. So we got these here. And now we're gonna already complicate things a little bit in line 68, guys. So we use the remove function, but now we're gonna specify a few more things. And you can always go down and read here what it actually does. But to explain to you what's going on here, we are creating a list, more about that later, where we say, okay, we're gonna use the set difference function, which takes the difference between two sets. You learned about set theory back in your mathematics course, so I know that much. Where you take LS, which is all the objects you have listed in your environment, and we're gonna subtract this constructed vector X and Y. I just said a lot of stuff, and easiest thing is just to run the code and see what happens. If I run the code, and we look down in my environment, you notice that C is gone. Now, what happened? I took all the objects and took the difference between all the objects I had, ls, this means all the objects. You can simply just put it in the help file to check it out yourself. And I took the difference between that and my combined vector, x and y. So I took everything minus x and y, what is left that is c, and I removed c with this remove function. This may seem a little uh, difficult already, because I'm simply encapsulating one command in another, but this is what's gonna happen all the time. So this is a good thing. So now I can actually run all these objects again, and you're gonna see while X and Y are there, as we can see over in our console, C is gone. Can't find it, it's all gone. Okay, so far so good. That should uh, take some of the basics. Now let's continue. We now reassign X and Y as five and 16. So now we see them down here. And now we're gonna do some basic mathematics. So R is indeed a calculator and that's a good starting point. So you can of course just calculate regular things. Plus, whoa, oh, five plus 16 is 21. Good to know. I can also subtract the two and hopefully I get 11. No, actually I get minus 11. Oh, <gasps> what happened here? Now you guys are gonna figure out what actually happened here. But what you do see here, uh, X minus Y, because you see here, Y becomes a minus. So you get minus minus, that's very strange. Now, what's gonna happen here? Let's try something else. Let's go back here, you see X is five, Y is 16. I take X plus Y, we got 21, no big deal. That was okay. We now say X minus Y and something else happens. What if I start putting in some parentheses? See what happens here. Does it change anything? You see, this is what I mean by we can just play around with different code and see what happens, right? 
we still get minus 11 here. And this is going to be something that's going to come back to you in exercise what's happening here. So I'm actually going to leave that one open on purpose. This is just some basic mathematic concepts. But of course, 5 times 16, well, if I'm not mistaken, that's 18. Or sorry, 80. Wow. It's good to check your basic math sometimes. But okay, these are the basic operations as we know. We also have some different functions here. So what is this percentage time, uh, percentage sign, divided by percentage sign? You see it gives 3. What is this? This is integer division, actually. So it gives you the whole number of times x goes up and y, basically. So if you take 16 divided by 5, it gives 3.2, as you saw here. But in whole numbers, in integer division, it's a 3. So that's what this function is. Um, we're going to come back to that one in functions, or rather Max is going to explain to that one in functions. Over the next one here, you also get the modulo. Modulus? Modulo? Yeah. Look it up, and indeed this is what we can actually use to help function. See? Bom. And then put this here, and put these in here, and see what happens. Arith arithmetic operations. Pronunciation is pretty good, I swear. We can look down, and we simply get an explanation what they all are. And then you can see here, can be used for non-integer, both results of subject representation, blah, 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 the loss of accuracy. What do we get here? Can be done in R. Yeah, I know it can be done in R. I just wanted to find where I can see, indeed, this is model. Oh, you can see it here. See? X model Y. So you can also use mod instead. You see? This is what the help function can do for you. Of course, I know, but it's good to know and go and check out where everything is coming from. Especially so I can show you what the help function is actually worth. Now, we can also, of course, just do the power to, which is the little hat here, of course. And this line, these two lines here, is actually pretty redundant, simply because it was already 5 and 16. We can also check statements. So logical statements. Is x smaller than y? That is true. Is x larger than y? I guess it's false, but it surely is. And then, of course, we can say x smaller than or equal to 5. Is that true? Yes, it is. And is y greater than or equal to 20? That is false. And we can also use two equal signs here to check whether it's 16. Now, what is the difference between one equal sign and two? This is why I want you to use the arrow, by the way, again, also. But when you use one equal sign, you're setting something equal to something. When you're using double, like here in line 102, you're testing for equivalence. It's also not only like this here, it's also like this in starts, if you're ever going to use that one later. It's going to work exactly the same. It probably comes back in a lot of other programs as well. But for the programs I use, it's definitely true. So that's the difference here. You can, of course, also say exclamation point equals to, which simply just means, you probably guessed it, not equal to. So is x not equal to 5? Well, that is false because x is equal to 5. See, this already is pretty good so far. Now, let me go for one more uh, chunk before we take a small break, okay? So we're going to discuss vectors. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you are having a course in linear algebra as well. And uh, you probably already had your basics in Mathematics 1 and 2. Please correct me if I'm wrong. But you're also having a course in linear algebra, which takes a little further. But basic concept of vector, you guys should know. Otherwise, you're going to learn it right now. We can, of course, also assign vectors, which is a sequence of numbers, characters, you name it. And this is where we're going to introduce the four types of atomic vectors in R. Actually, there's six, but we're going to be using four. We talk about logical, integer, double, slash numeric, you can call it whichever one, and character. They come in this order because that is R's coercion order. Often R would coerce something to a different type. We're going to see that a lot in just a moment. But logical, that's simply just true-false. We have integers, that is whole numbers. Double numeric, that is simply, well, also with decimals. And characters, well, are characters. You can see they're listed in terms of how general they are. 
they become more and more general, characters being the most general, because you can literally put anything in there, right? It's not only numbers, but also letters, for instance. So yes, a number can also be treated as a letter, of course. That should come as no surprise. But as you can see here, they become less or more and more detailed, depending on which way you go, of course. So of course, I could think of it, when I generate x using a combine function to combine all these numbers, so now I put x to be a vector of these five numbers. Now you see here, and then it also, you would think about what type is it? Well, it's double. That's what automatically the type it gives you. And you can also see it down here in your environment, so you actually don't have to use the type off command. You could, it's nice, and you can simply go and check it out. And uh, we got two more that is complex and raw. It's good that uh, somebody calls that out. Sorry for being a little slow on that. Complex indeed does refer to complex numbers and raw simply, I wouldn't say undefined, but I would say you don't need them for now. You're free to look them up, but we're not gonna be using them for the purpose of this course. I do mention them because otherwise you will come back and like, what is this? But we're only gonna be interested in these four main atomic vector types. Complex and raw, Leave them out of the equation for now. Free to look them up if you want to. So I hope that answers the question here from uh, Gideon. And please let me know if it did, because it's also the way I know if I can continue safely, so to speak. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you, Gideon. Now, let's uh, carry on. We can, of course, like I said, a numeric down here, so you can check which type it is. We can also check the length just using a length function and it gives you the length of five. Should not be a surprise. But notice here what happens now when we start using, well, different types within the same vector. This is where the coercion comes in. So if I define X like this, we now see X was one, 5.4, true and hello, basically one from each world. And then often I could even ask you, I even had this on the exam as one of the opening questions. I gave you a random vector and I asked you what is this type of this vector now? And then you would have to know, oh wait, there's a character in there, so it's gonna be coerced to the most general type that is a character. You can simply also just check it by using the type off function here. It will tell you character or simply just look down here in the environment. But in a pen and paper exam, you don't have that help, right? I give it a vector and I ask you, what is it? And then of course you should know. And you should also know what the coercion order is. That gives you a very good understanding what type can you actually, well, expect. So that's what it is. Whew. This is a lot. It is a lot, but we got a little more. We can also specify, well, shorthand notation, right? Because I could just write X is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But I can also write one colon seven, and that's a shortcut. So you see here now I got integers one to seven. Nice, that's fast. And of course you see I put a semicolon X on the same line. This is not good coding style per se, this is just shorthand notation for assigning X and printing it in the same line, just so you know. So you could put a semicolon at the end and X, then you see it prints it at the same time. Because if I would only run the first part, you only assign it, you don't print it. Okie dokie. We can do the same for Y. And now you see, what are we gonna do here? We generate a new vector from two to minus two and we print it. And you see the default is it jumps by one. You see, so I generate a vector that goes two, one, zero, minus one, minus two. That's the default, it jumps by whole numbers. But of course, you can also specify how fast should it jump and how long should it be and so forth. And that's what we have the sequence function for, SEQ. Look it up in the help file if you need more information. And uh, well, you are gonna do it because that's part of the assignment guys. So uh, heads up. So for instance here, I'm gonna generate a sequence that goes from one to three and increment by 0.2. Let's do that. And you see over here, boom, I printed it out. Because of course I didn't assign it anywhere, so it prints it directly. You also see because I just put the sequence function in there, I didn't assign it to a value, I didn't save it in my environment, right? So I just printed it out. So you see here, that's how it is. We can of course also force it to a given length by using the length out option. You see, I use comma and put in options. That's also something you would see down here if I would look up, let's try and look up the sequence function actually. So question mark SEQ, 
let's see what we get. Enter. Sequence generation. And then you can see here how the syntax is. So you see from, to, and by. And you can also get different other options like the length out and along with. You can go and check them out yourself as well, but we're going to see the length out here. In this case here, we generate a sequence from 1 to 5, and we force it to have the length of 4. So you see, it then figures out by itself what should the increments be, which is 1.3 in this case. Well, that's it. Not too bad. And of course, we can just print x here again. What was x earlier? That was 1 to 7. And now, let's go to the next little part. I know. And uh, we're not going to have a break right on time, but we have a break a little later, guys. Then, okay? Then, uh, But I will give you a break. No worries. No worries. Of course, we can also access specific elements using the square brackets. Not the soft brackets, but square brackets. Okay? So notice that here we are accessing the third element of a given vector. We can also access a sequence of elements, 2 to 4, or say 2 and 4. We can also all but a given element using the minus sign in front. So this will access everything but the first element. We can do the same thing for, the, say, the second element by writing minus 2. Then it will access everything but the second element. We can not mix positive and, positive and negative. It wouldn't want to do that. Why? I'm not quite sure. I don't know everything. I know a few things, but this one, nope. You can also, uh, it will also automatically truncate real numbers into integers. See, it does that actually for you. So it automatically rounds up and down. So that's pretty nice to know. Well, then again, it has to be real numbers. So it doesn't really round up. It only rounds down. It only looks at whole numbers in this case here. Because you can see 3.54 is actually rounded down. So it just truncates into integers. So far, so good. We can, of course, also specify to check what is true, true, false, true. Now, what's happening here, you may think? Hmm. It says here, we're going to print the first true. So that's one. We're going to print the second true. That's two. Then we're not going to print the third one. That's false. That's why three is gone. And the fourth one true. That's why four is there. And then it starts over again. Because if the length doesn't match up, it will automatically do it again. So what's going to happen here? You see it's at 4, but the vector is not done yet. So it starts over. 5 is true, it's printed. 6 is true, printed. But 7 is gone because false. That's how this works. So if the length doesn't match up, it's automatically going to start over again. Easy as that. Of course, we can also filter based on a given condition. So we can print anything that is less than 0. In this case, it wouldn't do anything because there was nothing less than 0. We can, of course, print everything larger than zero. Again, you can just change this number to try it out for yourself. I highly recommend that just to get a feel for how everything behaves. Okay. Then I have a few more things to do. I know this is a lot, but I wanted to round off this section before we take a break. Okay. So we can, of course, also assign names to each of the value. And you may think, why are we doing this? Well, this is just small baby steps towards making data matrices. So let's give it a, give it a, give it a go, okay? So what we're going to do is we can assign x to be 3, 0, 9 and give each of these a name. First, second, and third. And then, of course, we can use the names here to simply just print the names of these different elements in the vector. So you can imagine we have now three elements in my vector x, or, you know, the vector named x, if we want to put it correctly. And I actually gave each of these elements a name. First, second, and third. So 3, 0, 9 have the names first, second, third, respectively. And then, of course, I can just call it by the name now. So I can call out second. And it'll print 0. Nice. I can also call the first and third. And then, of course, no surprise, print out 3 and 9, the two other elements. Not so bad. And of course, I can still, of course, just print the whole X like this. And now it will, of course, also print the names. You can see how it built towards the data matrix or a data frame. We're going to call it here later. But because we're simply naming each of these columns. So you can see how we just take it step by step to get something that will make, well, a little more sense and be of more value to you moving forward. Okay. Let's uh, do the last few things here. We have a few more lines here. 
And here we can modify specific elements. So here you can say, okay, element two is going to be changed to a one and print X. So you see, I changed it from zero to a one. We can also modify based on a condition. So we say anything that is less than zero should be modified to a five. Well, since there was nothing less than zero in this uh, vector here, nothing's happening. Okie dokie. And finally, we can truncate, well, the first four elements. Before I run this here, you may think, what's going to happen? Our vector is only length three. And now I'm truncating to four elements. This is where you're going to be introduced to the null. So you see here it goes first, second, third, and now we have a blank space. Blank space. Indeed. And that's what happens here. So you just get NA, not available. And of course, if I print it, no surprise, same again, because I already printed it. Finally, we can, of course, empty out the whole thing just by writing null. You see, now I put everything null. So now X has absolutely nothing in it. And with that said, this is a good time to take a break. I'll be uh, back here at, uh, at the hour. So we get about 12 minutes. That should be fine, right? Because we don't have too much left. And then I'll see you back for the second part of today's lecture. I hope you enjoyed it so far. And yeah, uh, let's go for a small break. And uh, yeah, enjoy, guys. See you guys back in a little bit. Bye-bye. And we are back. I hope you can hear me. I hope everything is loud and clear. And I hope you can still see me. Hello there. And the good thing is, the good hope I should also get these out. It's not that I, when I listen to myself the whole time in my head, it just, oh, you know, delay, delay, delay. But okay, pour a little coffee. And then we're ready to go on round two of this programming for you are lecture one ladies and gentlemen i hope you are ready i can see we are upping up the viewers on 78 that's fantastic to see um i may already want to warn people who are not here that's weird am i warning people who are not here but that's good for you to know for you who are here it's very good idea to be here because you get to see it right it's going to be hard doing assignments on stuff you have never seen before right so if you meet your fellow students that was not here today, let them know, drop by. Okay, we were talking about vectors and we're gonna use vector operations. And the first thing we're gonna do is simply just define two new vectors we're gonna be working with, X and Y, and each of them has three elements. These basic operations you've done in mathematics, but have you never done in programming? I don't think so, and now you have done it. Because we can add them, we can of course check logical statements, for instance, you add element wise to six, that's eight. You add eight, four, that's 12, three, one is four. And you can simply check is X larger than Y position by position. So you see for the first case, that's false. Then it's true, then it's true. That's it, yeah, yeah. And now let's define two vectors with different length. One has length four, the other one has length two. And what happens now when you start adding them element wise things get recycled, just like we had in the last hour, right? So now it simply just recycles, 9, 4 is used twice. It starts over again. It's very important to know this is the behavior of R. And this is why I show it, because this can also come with some neat shortcuts sometimes. And also to understand, why is my code like this? I don't understand my output. And of course, you can also just recycle the scalar. So of course, we're just minusing one on all locations here. So you see you subtract one from each location in X, making it one, zero, seven, two. Okie dokie. Now we can of course also do this here, but before I get too far, now since we're not doing element wise anymore, it can't, the length has to match when you're doing it vector by vector and not vector element or element element. And of course, we can also just do the sum of different things like this, a nice sum function. This is just to add in and say, hey, there's also a sum function. You can, of course, also check out the different functions in R. I bet there's a function for basically anything. And of course, we can print X and see what we're dealing with. And of course, we can also just have sum X. And of course, infectious. What is that? What, huh? what is infectious? That means that if any element in your X is not available, like any of them, and you use sum, then it becomes all NA. 
It's kind of like the same in Excel, right? If you take the sum of a row or a column and some of the things in there is a character, it just returns zero or gives an error or something like that. It doesn't do the way you want it to do. And it's exactly the same here. This is infectious behavior. It's funny to say this nowadays because we learned about it, a lot of infection in the last couple of years, right? So this is exactly that kind of behavior, I guess. We can, of course, in R, R is a little smarter than Excel when it comes to this, you can still just add the function na.rm equal true to remove all these values here. And then we are not affected by infectious behavior. So this is a very good thing to know. And you can do the same with the mean and the product even if you would have not availables in there, in this case we don't, but using this na.rm equal true would remove these just for the time being, thereby, thereby, um, thereby. Um, a, a good question here from Gideon here. I think it just ignores characters when using sum. Sometimes I have also been in the case where it just does zero, but let's go check it out, or you guys can go check it out. I'm not gonna work with Excel here. But uh, I do think you have a lot more options here. That's for sure. You may be on something. I'm going to go check it out myself after one, Gideon. Thank you very much. And we can, of course, well, sure, we print it. But we can also find what is the minimum. It's one. That's the smallest number. It can also give us a maximum. And those are the kind of things that are going to be very handy when you, have, for instance, have a much longer row that you can see. And you're going to be like, but what is the maximum here? We can, of course, also, what is the range? So it goes from one to eight in this case. So it gives you both, right? Minimum and maximum, showing you where it goes from and to. And we can of course also found which position, which min and which max. So which position does each of these items hold? Where's the minimum, where's the maximum? And of course there's alternate ways. And with this saying here, this is also saying, hey guys, this is basically also just saying there's many ways that leads to Rome. Now, there's a question in the chat. Uh, the script will go up. Thank you very much, Max. You are quicker than me. This is exactly uh, very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Indeed, the script will go up. I even, I'm not even sure after lecture, maybe even doing, but it should be available on Nestor regardless today. So you can follow the script yourself. You're welcome. You can also watch this one back later, of course, with the script. That will help. Now let's go to booleans and logical operations. So here we define a new type of vector, which is of course numeric because of our coercion. Because remember, boolean or logical is the most basic type. It only takes on true false. And we introduce numbers, it gets coerced into numeric or double, whatever you want to call it, right? And we put the other vector y now, which is of course now a logical vector or logical Boolean, you can call it as well, because it only consists of true false. And of course, we can also do operations here. We can, of course, now say what is not x, so reverse position. So, for instance, if you look, why is the first one false? That's because it's true. False becomes true. Zero becomes true, because zero was false. And six being true now becomes false. We can, of course, also check position wise each of the elements. What do they match? We can also evaluate the whole thing, whether it's a match or not. That's what these one and sign and double and sign would do. Again, this is where you can go and use the help function to figure out exactly what is happening here. We can also do the or, and that's the, now I have to be careful, the vertical line. That's the or function. And of course, double vertical line, they have the same idea as with one and two and. So these, is the lot, these are the logical ands and or commands. Very good to know. Now, let's go into the matrices. Because now we dealt with vectors, let's expand the things a little bit. So first of all, let's define a new matrix A. So I just write a matrix 0, 1. And of course, now I'm going to use my damn... Uh, help file myself here because it always works with row column. Honestly, I must admit here, I never remember if it's column row or row column, but it's row column. So we define zero one, we print A. What is it then? It's a nice little vector here, data you see. It's not a value anymore, it's data. So you can actually go and take a look at it. 
If we double click on it, it opens up here in R and we can see what's the value in here. So what does it give? It gives you, it fills the vector with zero in a one by one vector. You can, or a one by one matrix, sorry. You can also read it, of course, as a vector just with one position. Same idea. Close it down, go back to the script. And now we can, of course, make a different matrix. We write 6, 10, 10, because first we say, what's the data we put into the matrix? Yeah, red pill, blue pill, I know. And then you put it a 10 by 10 after that. So that's why we get here, as you can see printed, a 10 by 10 matrix full of sixes. We can, of course, also create a diagonal mat matrix. For those who are not sure what a diagonal matrix is, it is zero on all the non-diagonal elements from which the rest here is just a one on the basis, right? So you see here a 10 by 10 diagonal matrix simply created by the function called diag. We can, of course, also do 10 by five here, and then we only get a five by five. So we put tens in there in a five by five. How these matrix diagonal, these things here, this is indeed where the learning by doing comes in. How does everything work in R? Because it may behave differently if, for instance, you've been used to a different software before, say Stata, Python, SPSS, whatever you've been working in, doesn't matter. They all behave a little differently. And of course, we can also, again, we define exactly the same diag matrix here. We define a new matrix B, which is just a five by five filled with fives. So you already notice hmm, they have the same size. That's good to know, which means now we can make all the matrix operations. Because remember, it has to add up, of course. So let's try that. What are we doing here? We're doing matrix multiplication, of course. And of course, we can also solve A. How to solve it? We can get the trace of A, I believe it is. That is indeed the trace. Uh, or transpose it, sorry, my bad. And transpose B. We can also get the Koleski decomposition. All these different kinds of functions. This is just very, very easy. Uh, let me see. What happens if we don't put the A in the matrix function? Let's take this one out. Thank you for asking the question. So, um, um, I actually got two questions here. So let's take them from the top. First question is, could I just write 610? Yes, indeed. If it's just the same, yes, I believe you can do so. Because that's exactly as I'm saying when you do 10, 5. So when I define the matrix up here, 6, 10, 10, you could also just say 6, 10. But indeed, I'm actually not going to try it out here because you could try it yourself. But I believe so. The answer is yes. And that was for Ryan. We got a second question here. What happens if you don't put the A below the matrix function? Well, we don't print it. A is only made here just to print it. If I would, suppose now, I'm going to clean out all my objects so it's empty. I define A. If I stop here, I've just defined A but not printed it. That's it. The line below here just tells R, oh, let's see what's in A. That's what it is. And that's for Vado. So if I would just go and put A, it just prints A. It just prints the object that I want. So, and this both for both Ryan and Vado, uh, does this answer your question? Let me know, because then I know whether I can, well, safely continue. In the meantime, you can, of course, also multiply. Uh, well, of course, I have to define B first, my bad because I deleted it. You can, of course, define X and multiply vectors by matrices, of course, if the dimensions add up, because dimensions has to add up as you learned in mathematics, or if not yet, you're learning it in linear algebra for sure. And the answer for Vaxel, yes, that is true. Just as with the vectors, it's general. You print out any object that you have actually. So whether it is a matrix, or it's a data frame, or it's a yeah, vector, anything. You just put the thing, it'll call what the object it is and print it for you. Does that make sense, Varo? And you're welcome, Ryan. Happy to help. That's what I'm here for. So I hope that answers those questions, because now we're going to go into, I think, the best part of everything, and that's random number generation, because I like probabilities. I like games of chance, not to play them all the time, because that's just a losing game if you go to casino too often, but also just to know what happens with all this concept of random. Now, let's, let's first set something very clear. Random number generation in basically any software is not truly random. 
it is what we call pseudo random because it's actually just a large database of different draws that you're picking from. So it's not true randomness in that sense. Okay? So I don't lie when I say I like this very much. I actually deal a lot with, with outside work and inside work because, of course, I teach statistics as well. But I also do a lot on my channel. So if people have not checked the channel there, then go over and check it out because I have a lot of stuff about probability over there. And it may come back to you later. Not right now, but what can we do in R? We can, of course, use sample. Sample can help you sample random numbers from, well, under given conditions. So, for instance, here, we're going to sample from between 1 and 100. So, we randomly sample between that space, and we're going to sample 10 times. And we're going to accept replacement. What does that mean? That means we can hit the same number more than once, because it's sampling with replacement. So, look up here. Bum, 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 bum. Now I'm just randomly sampling all the numbers, as you can see here. I can just keep keep doing this, and I randomly sample every time a different sample. You notice here none of these two samples are the same. Sure, there's a probability that, of course, you will hit the same sample twice, but the probability, sample, the probability of that happening is infinitely small. It's still there. It's like the same saying as the probability of my bunny killing in my sleep is very small, but it's not zero. Think about that. And indeed here, that's the same if you want to draw the same sample twice. But how can we make sure that we actually draw the same sample twice? This may seem like cheating, because then it's not random anymore. But in order to replicate your study or replicate your results in a paper you're writing, in your thesis, in whatnot, in this course, for instance, we can use the function called set seed. I would highly, and I, and I repeat, highly recommend you check this out because this is extremely important. Basically, I based last year's examples half based on this because I love it. But it's also very, very important, of course, when you do simulations. What does set seed do? Set seed followed by any number. You can pick any number. I pick 42. You can figure out why, but I can tell you it's because that's the answer to life, universe, and everything, of course. You can pick any number. You can pick 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 billion. Who cares? This will make sure that you draw exactly the same sample every time after set seed. So if I set seed to be 42 now, and then I sample, oh, it's the same. Wait a minute. But then again, if I then do these lines both at the same time, boom, 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 boom. Notice how the same sample is reproduced every single time. And I can, of course, just do the same here with this seed here. This, of course, is a different draw from before. But again, if I set seed again here, I will draw the same sample every single time. That's it. Simple as that. Very, very important, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot stress that enough. And of course, you can do this a little more sophisticated. If I do this, sample 1 to 6, size 1. I sample once. What am I replicating here? I am replicating a row, a row with a nice little six-sided dice. Or a die, actually. One die, two dice, I know. And of course, I got a whole... I got a whole bag of dice here, actually. And these are mostly 20-sided, 10-sided, whatever. And uh, people think, ah, oh, but it's because you play D&D, and I do that once in a while. Actually, very rarely lately. Uh, but I also do when I play Pokemon a lot. So, whoop. yes, I do. I do that. And of course, we can also do coin flips, because coin flips. We love coin flips, and we can do heads, tails, 10 times, with replacement. So you can see I can replicate a series of coin flips. And of course, you can go and study the law of large numbers. You can go all these kind of things. And again, you can choose any number of set seed. It doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen. You can just choose any number you want. Just make sure you choose the same if you want to replicate your sample. I choose 1, 2, 3 because 1, 2, 3, but more importantly, I choose 42 because that's the answer to everything. Ha -ha. But you can pick your favorite number. doesn't matter. And of course, what can we do here? We can also make the coin unfair, of course. I say of course, but who would know? Normally, in a fair coin, it should be 50-50, as you know. But here I'm saying I want to sample from success-fail, or, well, heads-tails, 10 times, replacement is true, and a probability here. Now, what is the what is happening here? I'm actually just doing a binomial distribution, basically, or trials here. You see, 
I give the success probability here 90 that it will be success and 10% fail. So on average, I should fail just one time out of the 10. But see, depending on my sample, sometimes I succeed every time. Other times I say fail three times. Let's do it again. This time I also fail, I fail twice only. And here I only fail once, for instance. You can just keep drawing. If you want to have the same draw, use set seed, of course. Like I said, this is one way of doing that binomial distribution. It's not my favorite distribution, it's actually the hypergeometric, because that's just a binomial without replacement, because that's one and very important when you play card games. That's exactly how you will calculate a draw of whatever given thing in a deck of cards. Be a poker set, be a game of Pokemon cards, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic, you name it, it doesn't matter. So we can, of course, draw from a lot of different distributions here in R. This is just how we would set up for a random draw, but you can also draw from a uniform, Posong, binomial, like I said, normal distribution, T distribution, F, you can draw from basically whatever. So you can look it up here, the help file, it gives you how it will work. Why am I doing this? Because you may need it later. Wink, wink. And of course, we can also draw from a Poisson like this. So you can use the R function, R Poisson, that is draw a random number from Poisson 1000 times with the parameter lambda equal to 1. What we're not doing a distribution class here, but you should know maybe about this here because you are having probability distributions in this block as well. So I hope this you're going to enjoy that course because if you found the probability theory was hard, yeah, it's going to be a tough ride, guys. And uh, this is uh, this should uh, wing off this here. I would highly recommend if you want to know more about distributions here. I got multiple videos on exactly on this or number generation or random numbers on the channel as well. But let's go on to the last little part here for today, which is strings. Here, I would like to take a step back, or actually I'm going to roll back a little bit and then simply explain a few things here regarding strings. Because here we're going to relate to characters. Remember the coercion order? The most basic type was logical and the most advanced or general type was characters. Characters, a whole string of characters, you see the naming here? This was just a string. And strings can, of course, both be letters and numbers. doesn't matter. So, of course, anybody who's seen a program, anything, uh, you, if you learn Java or anything, you always learn first, system out print line, hello world. And, of course, in R, it's just print hello world. And, of course, here it comes with quotation marks, but we can, all, of course, just remove them by using the comma quote false. Hello world without the quotation marks. So, yes, I could have started the class here, but... Nah, that would have been too lame. And uh, we can, of course, also use a print paste function here. And of course, we can say, how are you? So you can print different things together. You can also uh, print like this plus a random number. You can pump the user to put in some things. There's so many things you can do with this. And why is this so important? Because, well, in previous uh, iterations of this course in the examination, we asked you to write programs at an exam, where you, for instance, simulated the role of a die where you print it out saying the die rolled and insert your random draw if you could reproduce that. That was basically just redoing lecture one and part of lecture two to put it in a function. That was how easy it was. And um, yeah, that's the things you can do here. And of course, we can also assign X hello. That says hello, which is the object, is assigned the name X as we decided within this class. And of course, we can use the substring command to, you know, just pick out part of this string. So a substring, right? So, alo, alo. Don't know if anybody watched that show, but uh, I think it's pretty funny, but okay. And because I can, I can of course just do this here, like I said, alo, alo. And this is just exactly the same printed twice, right? So you can also, of course, use the n char to see how many, how what's the number of characters. It's corresponding basically to the length a function for vectors, right? In this case, we just ask how many number of characters. And of course, you can use the help function to learn more about it over here. Simple as that. And of course, we can also transform different things. And that's a very final thing we can do here today. You can, of course, say three is X. This is, of course, we look down here, that's numeric, usually, right? But we can also use the ask character to transform it into a character. So although R would automatically choose something a little more simple because it coerced to it, 
you can force it over to be a character. And that may be very important sometimes because some functions only take numbers as inputs and also only strings as input and so forth. So you will have to be able to transform things around. Likewise, you can go from character one because I put quotation marks around it, then it becomes a character. And I can go over and set it as numeric, transforming it back into numeric. Now, that is um, a few things I have done for you here. And now, with that said, this is actually everything I had for you today. So this is where I would like to round off today's lecture. You can also see this is uh, pretty cool because we stopped a little earlier. So you guys have some extra time, but you can already start an assignment or rather. I don't think the assignment is up yet, but you can uh, discuss your plan of attack with your teammate or sign up for a team now because the assignment is going to be going live here at 11. And then I wish you the best of luck. Please read the course manual carefully if you haven't done so already. Take the assignment seriously. Don't plagiarize. Please don't. That's just terrible. And it's annoying to write all these requests to the board of examiners all the time, but I will do it. Because, yeah, not going to let those things slide. And um, this lecture here will be taken uh, down and um, re-uploaded on the channel later. So if anybody is interested, you can uh, find back uh, the lecture here for today over here at some point later. Put the link here so you can find it. And uh, of course, I hope you enjoy today's lecture. I hope you like the style of lecturing. I hope that I was loud and clear and explained things in a nice manner. <laughs> At least what I hope for you guys. And with that said, I wish you all the best and good luck with this course. And be nice to Max, okay? Be nice. Be good students. And uh, maybe I'll see you around. Who knows? But until then, I hope you enjoy this class in Stefan's classroom. And I, well, I hope to see you back for another one, maybe. Have a good one. And bye, guys. Mm -hmm.